Well, if you have any kind of social media device, uh, the app may help you to just track some of the notes. I'll reference some and won't reference others. I want you to get this, so I'm putting it on the screen. I, I'm, I'm persuaded the function of leadership is change. That is what leadership is about, change. And leaders set the direction of change. If you're gonna do what you've always done, you don't need a leader. You can do what you've always done without leadership. Leaders bring change. They, they inspire it, they produce it, they align it, they call for it, and they bring change. Patrick, pointing people to the greatest leader of all time, Jesus changed a nation. Jesus changed everything. And if you decide to follow Jesus, then there will be a change in your life. If you decide to follow Jesus further, maybe, you, maybe you're a follower of Jesus. You follow Jesus further, there will be a change in your life. Whatever direction you've been going, at whatever depth you've been operating, if you take another step with Jesus, for Jesus, with God's people, there's change for you. And you don't have to be afraid about that because trustworthy leaders lead change without bringing wounds and harm intentionally to those who are trusting them to lead. There are always consequences and there are costs to change. And sometimes for the followers of great leaders, there has been great cost for a worthy cause. When you follow the greatest leader of all time, G-O-A-T, greatest of all time, Jesus, change comes. And you fling your life into following Christ and you'll face change. It's what Jesus calls us to. And in all of it, we're reminded constantly that he is with us and he loves us and he has a purpose to call us and lead us out of darkness into his light. I don't know who influenced you most in your life, but I'll tell you this, my parents had a profound influence on me and their parents also influenced me. My mother was the only child of a Methodist preacher and his wife. Now, I'll tell you this, my grandpa, the Methodist preacher, he was, how shall I say, stern. And gra grandma was uh, with him, and my mom was their only child, and my mom had me in church every Sunday from the time I was born, every Sunday. And um, I don't think going to church makes you a Christian, but I don't think it hurts. I think you learn about the stories of Jesus, and you and you see people following Jesus, and I think that there's a great gain to participating even as a kid, and I did. Mom had me there every single Sunday. And it was something to be a part of that. Well, on my mom's side, there was great influence. And on my dad's side, woo-wee, my dad, World War II vet, said what he meant, meant what he said. Well, his parents, my grandma and grandpa on my dad's side, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. they operated a working farm in Hagerstown, Indiana, north of Hagerstown, four or five miles. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Hagerstown, Indiana. I know not anyone's been to Hagerstown. I know. I know. That's where my dad lived. On a working farm, he was the youngest child of my grandma and grandpa. I want to put a picture of grandma and grandpa and my dad and his family now, <clears throat> on the sofa is grandma and grandpa. They're in the middle. And you can see grandpa is not about to say a word because grandma is a severe woman to be reckoned with. I will tell you, see grandpa sitting right there? I never heard grandpa say anything. <laughs> Think about this. I don't remember my grandpa saying anything. Look at him right there. He's not about to say anything. Grandma pretty much directed the program, and we kind of did what she said. My dad is on the back row, second from, the, from our right, handsome fellow, Reginald Max. That's his name, Reginald Max. Who does that to their child? <laughs> so when I was born, on my birth certificate, does it say Reginald? No. You know, my first name is just the letter R. And even now you're thinking, yeah, but it stands for Reginald, right? No. 
My dad hated the name Reginald, didn't want to name me Reginald, but he wanted some kind of, you know, legacy, pass it on thing. So he just gave me the letter. My, my name is <laughs> Who does that? Went to grandma's house, because it was grandma's house. We never called it grandma and grandpa's house. It was grandma's house. I think she let grandpa live with her. I, don't, I mean, she, I'm telling you, she was something. My grandpa told me one time, he said, he said, listen, whatever your grandma says to do, you better do it. All right. Well, then later my dad pulled me aside, like a whole different year, and said, now, Mark, whatever your, gra- whatever your grandma says to do, you better do it. Well, I'm like, who is this woman? <laughs> Terrified both of them, I'll tell you that. They're on a working farm, at a chicken coop. We went there every, I mean, every week, virtually every week. Had, had uh, dinner, Sunday dinner. It was only an hour, less than an hour to their house from our house. And so we drove over there and it was family and it was grandma and gra- she let grandpa, you know, sit at the table and, and uh, it was great. I remember one time, though, when I was just a child, I remember Grandma saying to me, follow me, boy. We got to get dinner. Follow me, boy. She loved me, called me boy. Follow me, boy. We got to get dinner. Well, I had heard from my father and grandfather, it's best to do what Grandma said. So I jumped up right away, and she went out the kitchen door outside, and I followed her out there. And of course, it was just chickens, you know. She... She, with like a, a shortstop, <laughs> swept out with the grace, you know, and just caught this chicken by its legs, just swooped its legs right out from under it, so it's upside down. Just whoosh, one smooth motion. Now, I was impressed by that. It all happened so fast. And then she took that bird hanging upside down, flopped it down on the ground, stomped on its head, and pulled its head off. Don't mess with grandma. (laughs) That's what I learned right then. That's not politically correct. You can't do that. What do you do, grandma? I'm a child scarred for life. My mom told me one day, I was a child. I'd never stayed anywhere overnight. Why would I stay anywhere overnight? My mother right here, I have a room. I don't want to leave my mother to go to some stranger's house with strangers and strangers, strange people, a bunch of strangers. I'm a child. I like being with mom. Why would I spend the night? Mom said, you know, Mark, uh, your dad and I have planned for you to spend the night at, grandma, at grandma's house. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, I I thought maybe if I don't say anything, she'll forget. But a few weeks later, sure enough, my mom said, Mark, we're going uh, this weekend. You're going to spend the night at Grandma's house. This is a bad idea. Because I knew that Grandma and Grandpa had their room upstairs. And the only place that there was a bedroom downstairs was the only other place that I could possibly imagine I would be sleeping. And I thought, well, then I'll be downstairs and they're upstairs. And I know I can't go upstairs because Grandma had said to me, You don't ever come upstairs, boy. That pretty much settled it right there. I'm not going upstairs. And I didn't. I didn't go. You can't go upstairs. I can't go upstairs. Grandma said, I can't go up there. I can't go up there. I can't. And so I'm picturing this. I'm going to be downstairs, and they're going to be upstairs, and it's nighttime. What good can come from that? And I'm all alone, which I don't like to be alone. You know, there's a lot of monastic, great leaders in the church, you know, that kind of holiness thing for 2,000 years. People talk about solitude and silence. What? I can't imagine either of those being helpful to me. I like people and noise. Thank you for coming just so I'm not alone here. I I don't want to be alone. I'm trying to picture being at grandma's house alone downstairs and they're up and I'm down and I can't go up. What in the world is that? Well, sure enough, day came. 
And my mom, we're there. And she said, this is, the, this is when you're going to spend the night at grandma's house. We're already there. So I can't flee or anything. We're already there. Whew. Time came. Mom and dad left. There I am. Afternoon. I'm just outside because I, I love outside. And so I'm outside. And then it's evening and I'm outside. And then it got dark and I'm outside. And when the sun went down, uh, the moon came up and it was a great harvest moon. Bright, no clouds, gentle breeze. And I'm outside and I'm thinking, I'm not going inside, I'm not going inside. I'm not. I've never been, I've never been overnight. I don't wanna be alone, I don't like this at all. And then it happened. Grandma opened the door. Get in here, boy. Oh. So I went inside. Grandma, with clarity. This woman never lacked for clarity. Get ready for bed, boy. Uh, I did. And then she said, as I was walking into the bedroom and she was sitting in the chair beside the bed, she looked at me. This had never happened to me. She looked at me and she said, you best say your prayers, boy. <laughs> you best say your prayers, boy. I was terrified. So I started because I knew you got to do what you got to do what grandma says. And <clears throat> so I started praying. Have you ever prayed with a child? Then they seem to not want the prayer to end. They opened their eyes, they're looking around. That's what I did. Because I knew when I said amen, they were going upstairs. I can't go upstairs. I'm going to be downstairs. They're upstairs. I'm all alone. No good can come from that. And so I just kept praying. I think it's, I'll just pray. Because they can't leave until I'm done. And I just kept praying. Yeah, have you been with a child? You know, I'm looking around. Thank you for the drapes. Thank you. Right? Again, grandma is so helpful in training in righteousness, right? said, say amen, boy. <laughs> amen. And it was done. I knew it. I knew it. And I said, amen. And she left and she went upstairs. And now they're upstairs and I'm downstairs and I can't go up and I'm down and I got in bed and I laid there under those covers. And you remember that big old harvest moon, that great big harvest moon and the gentle breeze? Well, outside the window of my room downstairs was a giant tree with gnarly branches and as the wind blew those branches that looked a lot like monster's claws to me started scratching to get into my room against and the shadows and I started crying because I'm gonna I'm gonna die and the monster tree is there and I'm alone and they're up and I'm down and I can't go up and it's terrible, it's terrible. And so I just trembled and cried and trembled and cried. And I felt so alone in that darkness. I, I knew I couldn't go up. The most amazing thing happened I, I didn't realize it right away. Grandma came down. And she sat down in that big chair by the bed. And she reached over and put her hand on me. And I was, I was crying and trembling. And she said, I'm here, boy. I'm here. And I was crying. I said, Grandma, I... I knew I, I knew I couldn't come up. I knew I couldn't come up. And she said, in compassion and care, she said, that's right, boy. <laughs> you can't come up. You can't ever come up unless I take you up. But I'm here. She had her hand on me that whole time. I'm here. I'm with you. And you don't have to be afraid anymore. I've often wondered how many 
of my friends and family and neighbors, people I know and people I don't. I've often wondered how many are stuck and afraid and alone and trembling and crying and there's no way, there's no way to fix the situation. They know that they can't go up. They can't get to the place where God might comfort them, where the distance they feel from God might be bridged. There's no way they can make that leap from where they are, isolated, confused, afraid in the darkness. There's, there's no way. I can't go up. They would say, I can't go up. But God came down. Friends, God came down. In Jesus Christ, God came down and laid his hand on us. And God is with us. And God says, you don't have to be afraid. I'm right here. I think about the religions of the world where people try all kinds of things to find a way to get right with, 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 the, with the, the one they've offended with God because of what we've done in this world. Each of us and all of us and those before us saying what we shouldn't have said, doing what we shouldn't have done. We use people, hurt people, wound people. We hurt ourselves, wound ourselves. We violate relationships and covenants. We lie and steal and cheat. We act with pride and envy and sloth and gluttony and never stop consuming more. The monster of more rules our lives. And we hate those who get in our way. And we think that this is going somewhere. But all of us wake up at some point and realize I'm running into a wall here. I'm running over a cliff here. I had best do something about this. And so I, I get religious. I try to give enough, do enough, work enough, go to sermons and services enough that maybe, maybe I can build up credits and get right with God because I know I've offended God. I don't even know for sure who God is, but I'm telling you what, my life is anything but holy, life-giving, good, and righteous. So what do I do? I give, I serve, I, I pray more, I punish my body, I discipline myself to go without being religious. And at the end of that journey, we cry harder knowing this isn't working. Even if I give and sacrifice and somehow do a religious activity that may somehow help, maybe, it only lasts 18 minutes and then I sin again. I lust again, I hate again, I lie again. And I just cry because I'm down here and I can't go up. It may be the best news in the whole world that God came down. And we're not alone. You are not alone. It's not bad to tremble and cry. Some things are worth trembling and crying about. When grandma came down and laid her hand on me and said, I'm right here. I just can't stop making the analogy to God that this is what God did in Jesus God came, I am right here. I'm with you. When Jesus called his first disciples, Jesus, greatest leader of all time. When he called his first disciples, uh, folks, they left everything to follow him. I mean, left everything to follow him. And uh, one of those was John, a man named John. And in the story as it unfolds of the ministry of Jesus, you look at the history of that journey with his disciples and Jesus was very close to all of them and he was then especially close to a few. John was one of those with whom Jesus was so close 
that he began to be referred to as John the Beloved because he loved Jesus. And he's a great man. And he'd given his life to the greatest leader of all time. John, after Jesus' betrayal, his death on the cross, his crucifixion, his burial, and then his resurrection. After all of that, John wrote the story, the, the, the good news account of Jesus. And in his gospel, in the third chapter of John, he tells the story of Jesus talking with a, a, a very religious man who, you know, do all the religious things to be right, to get back up where, where you're supposed to be with God. His name was Nicodemus, and Jesus was talking to this very uh, religious man. And, and the questions are coming and answers are coming, and the question comes, how do I, how do, I do this? How do I live so that I, I have eternal life? What am I supposed to do? And Jesus, this is that passage some of you've heard. Jesus said, well, you must be born again. Well, it's a full-grown man who's educated and scholarly, and he says, what? excuse me, how's that supposed to happen? And Jesus talks with Nicodemus, and, and then in this conversation in John 3, 13, I want you to see this. Jesus says, no one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. The one who takes you up is the one who came down. God came in Jesus to take us up, to bring heaven down so that we might live in the kingdom of our Lord and Christ now and to take us up. The one who came down is the one who takes us up. Our rescue is not in our religious effort. Our rescue is in the one who is the way and the truth and the life. Life is found in him. He gave his life so that we could live. And he laid his hand on me, friends. And I want you to know right around you right now, many people in this room no, in their fear and darkness and brokenness and weeping, their shame or guilt, God came down and laid his hand on people all around you. And God has his hand on you, though you may not realize it until right now. And he laid his hand on you so that you don't have to be afraid. And God would say, you don't have to be afraid. I'm right here. I am with you. I'm the way up and out. I am the way forward. I'm life. The greatest leader of all time lays his hand on us and he calls us to follow him. Follow me. The one who came from the presence of God is the one who takes us back up to the presence. Grandma said, that's right, boy, you can't go up there ever unless I take you up. I can't get the words of Jesus out of my mind. I am the way and the truth and the life. To the Father? Back to the Father? Oh, no, no. no you don't make your own way there. It's not, no, no. <laughs> no one comes to the Father except by me. I just see my grandma. David, king of Israel, same guy who killed the enemy of Israel, Goliath, with a stone he threw from a shepherd's sling. David wrote in Psalm 18, 16, God reached down from heaven and rescued me. I bear witness to all of you. God came in Jesus and he rescued me. And God came in Jesus to rescue you, every one of us. God came down, and we don't have to be afraid. 
He's come to bring the kingdom, to invite us into it, to forgive our sin, give us a new start and a new beginning. And he's come to bring us to life. And that life is eternal. We are his. You're invited to follow Christ. Surely as Patrick said yes to Jesus and God used his leadership to change a a country, I tell you this, who you follow, everybody look at me now, look at me, I'm, I'm almost done, look at me. Everybody you follow, the one you follow, the choice you make, this is the one greatest leader of all time, whoever that, well, you, you decide who you'll follow, but the one you follow will set you on a course. Leaders change things. And if you follow the leader of your, of your choosing, it will change your life. Choose wisely the one you entrust your life to, the one you follow. And I beg you, follow Jesus, because Jesus is the greatest leader of all time. Follow Jesus with us.